Hey, you're all very welcome to the KB of Fulcher over in Shaw uh, to this very special uh, lecture. And um, it's great to see such a, a big turnout, guys, and we're really impressed with that. And it's also wonderful to see colleagues from practice here today, because clearly they're, they're busy people and coming in, they're making a big effort. Also, like to make a special welcome to our Dean and the Dean of Agriculture and Food Science as well. Um, I want to introduce our speakers. Um, and we have two speakers today. We have Rosie Allister and we have David Bartram. And if you look at the title, Mental Wellbeing, Building Personal Resilience and Supporting Others, it's, a, it's, it's a, a lovely title, really. And I think that they're going to work together. They're going to uh, deliver a, a pas de deux in a, in a presentation, really. And, uh, to say a few words about our two guest speakers. Rosie Allister, um, she graduated from, from Liverpool in 2005 and she, she completed an MSc in the whole area of looking at mental health and well-being in vet students. Um, she's been the chair of the Vet Helpline since 2010, is a director of the Deputy Benevolent Fund and has been a trustee and deputy director with the Samaritans where she's been a volunteer for 90 years. She's currently based in my alma mater, which is the Europe, uh, Edinburgh University, and she's at the moment com uh, completing a, a research project investigating the whole stress of transition from veterinary student to veterinary practice. Uh, and her clear interest is in mental health and well-being associated with that difficult transition. David Bartram is a graduate of the Royal College, uh, Royal Veterinary College in London. He spent a number of years in farm animal practice, moved into the pharmaceutical industry. He's now based in, in Paris with Zoetis uh, for their ruminant business in Europe. Um, but he, he also has been very much involved in research into mental health and well-being, particularly with regards to the profession, the veterinary profession. And uh, some of you will be aware of his publications, really important publications in the vet record and other Journals, uh, and he was awarded a, an MPhil from the Faculty of Medicine uh, at the uh, University of Southampton. So, with two very eminent speakers on a really important uh, day for us. And um, I would also just briefly like to thank all of those who's help, who've helped uh, get, put this together, particularly Trish Scale from Belinda, with being the office who helped with it, and of course, our One Health Committee for all their efforts. And they're brilliant posters, and they're doing a great job uh, in, in the school. And finally, it's, it's quite clear that this special lecture is dedicated to the memory of both Aeneas and Polly. So, Gurma, I'll just hand over to our speaker now. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Great. Thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that okay at the back? Great. Thank you. So, yeah, David and I are going to sort of, I'm going to start, David's going to talk for a little while, and then I'm going to finish off. We're going to talk about mental health and well-being in vets, so I just want to start off by presenting you some of what we know. I think what we know about mental health and well-being in vets has changed a lot over the last sort of 10 years, so it's, it'll be good to go over that. David's then going to talk about some determinants of mental well-being, what you can do, so evidence-based strategies to improve your well-being that are under your voluntary control, and then I'm going to finish off by talking a little bit about support how to support other people if you're concerned about them, but also support for yourself. So, I thought I'd start off by sort of posing some questions and hopefully in the next 10 minutes or so of me talking we'll have answered some of these. I wanted to define our terms. I think we use a lot of terms quite interchangeably sometimes, mental health, well-being and stress. So I thought as a group we'd define our terms and know what we're all talking about. Then I'm going to review the evidence on veterinary well-being. As I said, we know a lot more than we did 10 years ago. I'm going to look briefly at the risk factors for vet stress. Um, I've got a lot more data on that if people want, and I'm happy to send people references. And I'm also going to look at how to identify stre stress and how to identify poor well-being if you're concerned about somebody else. So first of all, I wanted to start off by just presenting you with two paradoxes. A lot of this talk is about you thinking, it's not about me just delivering. And one of the paradoxes I wanted to deliver to you was the fact that as vets, we're incredibly good at thinking in a very scientific way about animal welfare. I found this rather cute picture on the internet. I think it's supposed to be a practice waiting room. Certainly the hospital where I work, the waiting room doesn't often look like that. But any of those animals in that picture, 
each of you would be able to tell me a lot about its welfare and its welfare needs. We'd be able to talk about the five freedoms. We'd have a very evidence-based discussion about the welfare of those animals. We'd know the pug's brachycephalic, is its welfare compromised? We'd know the fish probably don't have enough oxygen in a tank that small with that many fish. All of those kinds of issues. And yet, when you talk to vets about well-being, and I've done a lot of talking to vets about well-being, both on helplines and also in my research, Actually, we don't always think about our own well-being in a very evidence-based or scientific way. In fact, there's quite good evidence that vets think about well-being and mental health in a less evidence-based way than the general population. For example, which is quite surprising, considering we're all scientists, we're all very intellectually sophisticated. If you ask the general population whether people with mental health problems have the capacity to recover, for example, vets are less likely than the general population to believe in mental health recovery. And actually, there's very good evidence for mental health recovery. So I just sort of wanted to pose that as a paradox. Why is it that we don't think about well-being in a scientific, rational way? And why is it that we don't look at the evidence? So if you do have any element of disbelief about the evidence on well-being, I'd like you to suspend that for the next hour, or just look at the evidence that we're presenting. My second paradox is to do with the way people see the veterinary profession. I don't know how you sort of think the general public see the veterinary profession. What sort of things do the general public think about vets? Yeah, we play with puppies, absolutely. Yep. Sorry? We earn a lot of money. We earn a lot of money, absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, sadly, <laughs> I know. They, um, another thing they sometimes think about is like James Harriet, the whole sort of rolling countryside and lots of comedic clients and lots of funny situations and not that much difficulty and yeah the puppies thing too i don't know if anyone can notice what's wrong with that picture <laughs> i am i'm i'm not going to say which large american veterinary group i found that on the website of but it's a it's a lesson perhaps in in, in proofing your pictures that you let people put on your website but yeah, I think this is how the public see us, isn't it? They think that we get to play with puppies. It's like James Harriet, or we drive around in big flash cars and we earn a lot of money and we're making money off them. We're ripping them off. And what I wanted to propose to you is that that perception versus the reality, I don't need to tell you that that isn't the reality. We all know that. But that perception versus the reality is a dissonance right there. And that in itself creates difficulty. And what I mean by a dissonance is a cognitive dissonance, so a dissonance between the reality and what we actually know to be true. So, what is well-being? I think that dog could breathe. They didn't leave it like that for very long, I hope. So, defining our terms. I've, um, I've used some of Matthew Johnson's pictures here. Um, Matthew Johnson is a fantastic illustrator author who writes books about depression and mental health using the metaphor of a black dog. They're cartoon books, they're at about my level, and um, they're absolutely fantastic at communicating ideas around mental health. So I've used some of his pictures here, but if anyone wants to go and look them up, I really would recommend it. Anyone got any ideas why I've got this slide up? Yeah, one in every four people has a mental health problem. Fantastic. So there's been a big um, anti-stigma campaign in the UK the last few years um, using this one in four idea. Now, you're all scientists. A lot of you will know a lot about epidemiology. Can anyone see what the difficulty with just saying one in four people has a mental health problem is? It doesn't say, yeah, it doesn't say how many, um, well, it doesn't say how long a period of time one in four people has a mental health problem. So can you see the difference? If one in four people has a mental health problem in their lifetime, that's different to one in four people having a mental health problem in this room right now. And that would also probably be different to one in four people having one in the last year. Does that make sense? Because they can come and go, like I was talking before. People can recover. So does anyone know which one that is? Which one the one in four actually means? Is it lifetime? last year or right now okay we'll do raising hands um lifetime okay last year right now okay well done so it's the last year people were actually right smallest group <laughs> The World Health Organization has just published some really interesting data um, in one of their new big studies, which is for both developed and developing countries. And that, it actually shows that the lifetime prevalence of mental health problems is actually very close to 50% now. 
So approximately one in two people will experience a mental health problem at some point in their lifetime. So what I often say to people when I talk about mental health to them is that as vets, even if you think it's never going to happen to yourself, as an employer or somebody working with other vets, it's very important to know about. So what is mental health? I've talked a little bit about it without defining it. We'll get straight on to the definition. My favourite definition for mental health is the one from the World Health Organisation. And you'll see why I like it in a second, hopefully. It's a state of well-being in which every individual realises his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. It's very similar, in a way, to the World Health Organisation definition of health, which defines health as a positive state. And I think it's really important that we define mental health in that same way. Mental health isn't just about specific, discrete pathologies, for example, specific eating disorders or psychotic disorders. Everybody in this room has a state of mental health at any particular time, and that can vary due to different things. But there's also things that you can do to control your own mental health to a certain extent. So what is well-being? It's more than just happiness or satisfaction. And this from a Foresight report. A dynamic state in which the individual is able to develop their potential, work productively and creatively, build strong and positive relationships with others and contribute to their community. It's enhanced when an individual is able to feel fulfill their personal and social goals and achieve a sense of purpose in society. So it's feeling good and functioning effectively. Mental well-being comprises a number of different elements, which David's going to go on to talk about more later. But it's things like positive emotion, engagement, meaning, self-esteem, optimism, resilience, vitality, sense of competency, emotional stability and positive relationships. And what I want to emphasize now is going back to what I was saying at the beginning, that this isn't just a woolly, poorly defined topic. It's actually really, really well evidenced now. Um, the UK Cabinet Office um, published a big report this week. And what they've done is they've actually spent a lot of money quantifying which professions have the highest levels of job satisfaction and well-being. Financially, it's now seen as a very important thing for people to understand. And along with that has come a lot of research and evidence. So what is stress? That's my final definition. I'm using the health and safety executive definition, which is that stress is the adverse reaction people have to excessive pressure or other types of demand placed upon them. I had a lecturer at vet school who used to say to us that if you're not stressed, you're not working hard enough. And I thought at the time he was wrong, and I still think now that he's wrong, although I think I have more evidence for it now. Stress isn't the same as pressure. Some people need pressure to sort of get up in the morning or revise for exams. I don't know if you're that way, but some people will only ever start revising for exams a week before, however much they know that isn't the best way to do it. They need that pressure. And pressure can be a good thing, but when pressure gets too much and you don't have the resources to cope for whatever reason at that time, then stress can happen. Stress is determined by a sort of demand control support model, which I'm happy to talk to people more about or send you details on. That's absolutely fine. Just one slide on the economic costs of stress. Again, this is me making a case that even if you don't think your own well-being is important, it will be important to you if you go out into the world of work and practice. These are figures from the UK, but I presume it would be very similar here. Stress accounts for 40% of all work-related illness in the UK, and that's likely to be an underestimate. A lot of people who go off with stress will say that they have a bad back or say that they have some other condition. So 40%, that's massive. 10.4 million working days lost. And one of the things about stress that has big impact for employers is that it has one of the highest days lost per case figure. That means people take more days off with stress than they do with any other complaint. So what do we know about veterinary mental health? As I said, there's been a lot of research on this in the last few years. There's also been a lot of media attention. And I think the media attention is for a number of reasons. There's almost a prurient interest from the media sometimes in veterinary mental health. If I speak at a conference and there's a lot of veterinary stuff being delivered and I'm speaking about mental health, the media will often want to talk about the mental health aspect. And I think that's partly because of that dissonance. They think that we're, well, the general public sometimes think that we're playing with puppies and we have a very high income and that we have this wonderful lifestyle. And actually, the fact that our mental health might be quite poor is a big surprise to people and they don't understand it. So I think that's why there's so much media attention. I'm not going to go through all these papers. This isn't the sum of the evidence on veterinary mental health by a long way, but these are just some of, I think, the key papers that help to illustrate some of the big points that have been made over the last few years. 
I'm very happy to send people references on all of this. I'm just going to summarise the evidence now, just on one slide. Um, again, it's a big simplification, but just going to talk this through. So what we know about vets now. Vets have higher levels of anxiety, depressive symptoms, and negative work-home interaction than the general population. Vets have a higher 12-month prevalence of suicidal thoughts, so that means they think about suicide more commonly within the last year. They have less favourable psychosocial working conditions, lower levels of positive mental well-being, an elevated suicide rate in most but not all countries. Um, it's quite interesting data recently, um, certainly in the UK, in um, the US, in Australia, New Zealand, um, and in France, all of those countries, do vets do have a higher suicide rate. In Denmark, they don't, and male vets in New Zealand don't as well. So it's interesting why that is. Is there something more protective about the way the profession is structured there, or do they have better support? Something we're interested to find out. Some subgroups of the profession may be at increased risk as well, poor mental health. What do we know about vet students? Um, this is some, from some research that I was involved with. We know that vet students have higher GHQ12 scores than the general population. GHQ12 is a way of measuring psychological distress. It doesn't measure if you've got a mental health problem. It measures how distressed you are, and that distress is often correlated with mental health problems. Um, if you look at the general population, um, about, about sort of 15 to 20% of people score very highly on that. If you look at vet students, about 30 to 50%, depending which vet school you look at, score very highly on that. So this is really sort of really quite strong data. Vet students have a higher incidence of suicidal thoughts than the general population, and it really is quite a high incidence. I'm happy to talk to people more about the specifics of that if you want. This is something that really concerns me, and it's something that we've seen at more than one vet school. We've repeated this research. Um, is that attitudes among vet students are quite stigmatised towards mental health. It's very difficult for vet students to feel safe talking about mental health sometimes because they think there is a stigma and they think they will be blamed. So they think people will see them as weak or they think people will see them as not good enough to be here, that kind of thing. In terms of the transition to practice, now this is what I was saying about subgroups of the profession that are at in increased risk. A number of different types of evidence suggest that younger vets are at higher risk than older vets of difficulties of psychological well-being. It's more common in females as well. So what are the risk factors? Again, studies in a number of countries. This is quite robust data now. But a number of different risk factors for veterinary poor well-being have been identified. I'm just going to go through these because there's quite a few. But it's things like managerial aspects of the job, working hours, workload, poor work-life balance, difficult client relations. Euthanasia is a big one that vets often don't like to admit to. I know a lot of vets who don't like to admit that they find euthanasia very difficult because they think people will judge them for it because it can be such an integral part of the job. But it can be really, really difficult. I think that's sometimes a hard thing for vets to say. Levels of support, job satisfaction, and delivering bad news. In terms of influencing risk for suicide, we do have some good data on this now about what influences vets' risk, and it is something that we understand a lot better. Again, I'm happy to talk in more detail about, with people about that if you want. So how do you identify stress? What are the signs of stress? Behavioural signs of stress, things you might notice, sleep disturbance, being tired all the time, not being able to sleep. Changed eating habits, eating more or less. Humans are quite an interesting species in that when they're stressed, they'll often go to extremes. So they'll either eat not very much at all or they'll eat an awful lot more than normal. Smoking or drinking more, we're one of the few species that self-medicate. Social withdrawal, mood swings affecting behaviour, twitchy, nervous behaviour. Changes in attendance, so somebody constantly arriving late when they used to be quite punctual. Mentally and emotionally, confusion, indecision, inability to concentrate, poor memory. So you can see that if you allow stress to go on, it doesn't help you in your study or your work. It actually makes things a lot, lot harder for you. Negative or depressed feelings, feeling disappointed with yourself, increased emotional reactions, feeling lonely or withdrawn. Sometimes people can become more outgoing when they're unwell as well. Again, those extremes. Loss of motivation, mood swings. Now, this is something, work stress can actually occur in groups as well. So sometimes if a practice or a team becomes dysfunctional, stress can be something that a lot of different people are experiencing at the same time. Things like disputes, increase in turnover, increase in complaints. These are often the things that you notice first. People generally going off sick more, so you can track trends over time if you're managing a group of people. 
difficulty in attracting new staff to the group because the word's got out that it's not a good place to be, poor performance and customers not being happy, clients not being happy. So I'm going to pass over to David now, who's going to talk a bit more about some of the positive stuff that we can do to affect our well-being. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the science of happiness. So why is it relevant to you? Well, just to summarise a little bit of, of what Rosie has just been talking about, if you're, if you're a veterinary student or a veterinary surgeon, um, you are at, we, we know that uh, as, a, as a cohort of people, we know that we're at increased risk of mental health problems, okay? So we need to be aware of that. We need to accept that. And we need to understand that there are plenty of steps that we can take um, proactively that we can build into our life every day and that can help uh, increase our resilience and help to reduce the risk of us actually su succumbing to, to mental health problems. Okay? So that's why it's really relevant. Why are vets at increased risk of mental health problems? Well, the, the whole um, structure hasn't been completely elucidated yet, but it's probably something to do around um, at one end of the spectrum is around uh, uh, self-selection, so selection into veterinary school. Um, uh, generally, the people that go to vet school are very high achievers. High achievers um, have uh, are more likely to high achieve, or you're more likely to high achieve if you are neurotic, if you have some um, conscientiousness personality traits, you have perfectionism personality traits, and we know from the literature that all those those types of things are, are potential risk factors for mental health problems. So that's, there's something in there as well, and we also know that um, there are some psychosocial elements of the of our working environment which can also uh, contribute to, to to problems. So. We're slightly at increased risk. Let's accept that, but let's learn how to build our own resilience. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So the whole subject of positive mental well-being <clears throat> has developed over the last probably 15 to 20 years. And the king of Bhutan back in uh, the early 70s, he decided that he was going to measure the um, uh, 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 the economic success of his, of his country, rather than using gross domestic product, he would use what he referred to as gross national happiness. Okay? And if, none of you, if you don't know where the state of Bhutan is, it's a little green dot on the globe there. Okay? So he was going to use that as a measure of economic performance. Now that has actually increased in popularity. And uh, now there are several countries around the world. For some reason, that slide doesn't want to advance. We are. There's now several countries around the world that um, measure their uh, mental well-being of the population on a regular basis. And uh, this is a World Happiness Report. So this, this summarizes some work that was commissioned by the United, Na United Nations. And they looked at different levels of mental well-being in different countries. Now. Well-being, although it comprises all sorts of different components, there are now very valid, reliable measures of mental well-being. There's a, there's a plethora of different um, psychometric scales that can be used that have been, as I say, they're valid, they're right, reliable, they're proven, they're good data behind them. And so that enables countries to measure mental well-being on a very clear, objective level. Uh, and it, as it's also helped to contribute towards this science of, of positive psychology and things that you can do to help to build your resilience. This is a quotation that I, uh, I'd like to start with. <clears throat> this is a quotation from Professor Sir William Osler. And he was one of the first professors of medicine at the University of Oxford. And he gave uh, lectures to uh, graduating students, and some of his lectures have been uh, published. This is a quotation from one of them. He says, to each one of you, the practice of medicine will be very much as you make it. To one, a worry, a care, a perpetual annoyance. To another, a daily joy and a life of as much happiness and usefulness 
as can well fall to the lot of man. Now, I, partic I particularly like this quotation. I think it was very um, appreciative of him because he recognized even then that the practice of medicine can be very much as you make it. He, he recognized even in those days before people were, uh, had done huge amounts of work on positive psychology that actually well, we're, we can control a lot of what goes on in our lives. Okay, So some of the things I'm going to tell you about today, although we may not have known about them in Sir William Mosler's time, I think they're, they're probably some of the things to which he would have been referring. One of the benefits of mental well-being, obviously, as a key criterion of mental health, there's a lot of evidence in the literature to show that if you have enhanced mental well-being, you also have enhanced physical health. Um, uh, the, the obvious one that there is, is the relationship between uh, stress and, and cardiovascular disease, for example. There is evidence to show that if you have high levels of mental well-being, you can have better immune function and uh, you can live longer. So what determines our mental well-being? So some of it's about our genes. It's a genetic set point. Some of it is about the circumstances in which we find ourselves in. And some of it is due to factors that are under our voluntary control. So if I was to ask everyone in this room to complete a, a valid and reliable uh, questionnaire uh, to, to measure mental well-being, um, and you were to score all the questions on that based on how you felt over the past two weeks, okay? And I was to collect all those in, score them all, uh, it's fairly likely that we'd end up with a, a normal distribution, okay? So there would, and there would be people at the, uh, the very bottom end of the scale of mental well-being, and there'd be people at the top end of the scale. So, <clears throat> what I'd like to ask you now, and I'd like you to think about, is what proportion of each of these three things account for the difference between the lowest scoring people and the highest scoring people in this room? Okay? So if the difference between the highest scoring and the lowest scoring people is 100%, say, how many percent is due to that genetic set point? How many percent is due to circumstances? And how many is due to factors under our voluntary control? Even if they're factors that actually we don't, we're not even aware we're doing. Who, who, doesn't, know the, who, who doesn't actually know the answer to this? Um, who would like to volunteer... Um, what proportion do you think is down to, to, to genes? So the difference between the people in this room with the highest level of mental well-being over the last two weeks and the lowest level of mental well-being, what proportion is down to the way they're made? Sorry? 10%. Ten. Ten okay. Any advance on 10? Sorry? 20. Okay. So we're still, people are generally thinking it's a fairly small proportion is down to our genes. Is that right? Sorry? I think it's quite high. I wouldn't have said that seven years ago, but I think it's quite high. I think it's about 40%. About 40%. Okay. What about circumstances? 30. 30. Okay. So you think, so, yeah, based on how you felt over the last two weeks, 30% is circumstances. Any, anyone agree, disagree, think it should be much higher than that, much lower? think it should be higher circumstances okay <clears throat> well here's what the literature says so in fact your genes account for 50 percent of it okay so that's that's all about your your temperament your personality traits your circumstances actually only account for 10 percent of the difference and Things that are actually under our voluntary control, even though we, we may not um, be aware that we're actively choosing to do them, actually account for 40% of the difference. And it's that 40% of the difference that 
clearly we have control over and that I'm going to talk about now. So, here's the 40%, if you like. These are the things we can do that will enhance our mental well-being. Now, all this is evidence-based. All this is real science. And we can divide those, those things into three different groups. Behavioural, so that's uh, developing good habit, habits. Cognitive, around positive ways of thinking. And motivational, so the energy to make things happen. I'm going to run very quickly through 10 different um, steps, okay? Now, I've plagiarized these from a website, Action for Happiness. But again, that's, it's, all, it's all very evidence-based. It's not, it, this isn't some um, well-meaning happiness uh, guru uh, spouting his uh, opinion, his or her opinions. Uh, this, this is, this is uh, deeply in, uh, embedded in, in science. And I've tried to cite some of the, the, the references at the, at the bottom of the slides, but often I've only cited one or two of the references. There are actually many, many, many references in support of them. So what are the positive things that we can do that will actually contribute to our mental well-being in a positive way? Well, the first thing is giving, doing things for others. And the literature talks about practicing random acts of kindness. Okay, so it's not all about money. It doesn't mean you have to give people money, um, but it could be as simple as kind words, thoughtful gestures, attention, time, ideas, energy, volunteering. Some of these really, really, really simple things. But they need to be random, they need to be frequent. And we know, again, through the literature, that there are health and longevity benefits from helping behavior that's fulfilling but not overwhelming. And actually, giving support is more beneficial than receiving it. And that, that's, that's real. So actually, when you're supporting someone, actually, you're getting more out of it than they are. It's true. Relating. And this is the single most important thing. So if you take away one thing from this talk, remember this one, OK? It's about connecting with people. So this affects uh, our mental well-being uh, more than any other single factor. Okay? It's about being connected. So ensuring we, have, uh, we develop and we maintain close, secure, supportive relationships. And when you think about it, we're sort of wired up for relationships anyway, aren't we? Because we, we as humans, we have emotions and behaviours such as love, compassion, kindness, gratitude, generosity, smiling, laughing, all those things. That, that's all about relationships. But the quality of the relationships is important. So uh, these need to be people that, uh, where you experience positive emotions together, you're able to talk openly and feel understood, you're able to give and receive support to each other, and you have some shared activities and experiences. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with having 200 Facebook friends, for example, but that that in itself doesn't mean you're connected. Okay, in in, in the context of in the context of mental health. Okay, it's about having. And most people may, may not have more than four or five people in their, in their lives with whom they're very closely connected and uh, that you, you do these things with, you have confiding relationships with, you totally trust each other. And that if, if you can have those four or five people, and if you can't have four or five, even if you've only got one, um, uh, then... Uh, you need to keep investing in those, in those confiding relationships. They're the single most um, important influence on your mental well-being. Okay? So be connected and have these uh, deep, meaningful, quality relationships. Um, and you only, like I say, you only need a few of those. Of course, you need all the other relationships with everyone else in your life as well. But those few deep, confiding relationships are the most important. Exercising, <clears throat> we need to take care of our bodies. 
And this is just one of, of many studies uh, that showed that, in fact, even in people with um, moderate levels of clinical depression um, can be alleviated by using, uh, uh, taking regular exercise. And it, this, is, this is fairly modest uh, levels of exercise. So this is, I think this was uh, three times, 20, 20 minutes of brisk walking three times a week. Okay? So exercising is very important in terms of our mental health, mental well-being. <clears throat> And it's the amount, so sort of the duration and frequency, rather than, than the intensity of exercise that's important in, within the context of mental well-being. Okay? So, a slightly different from um, if you're looking from physical benefits of, of exercise, you know, we, we talk about um, it's the intensity that's the really important thing. But actually, if you're looking for the, for the mental well-being, that actually comes much easier. Okay? It's about doing little and often. It doesn't need to be particularly intense. So you don't need to be an Ironman triathlete or, or be, be running marathons twice a week uh, in order to enhance your mental well-being. Okay? Sleep is extremely important too. You need to plan times of rest and relaxation into each day. And we need to think about uh, what the literature refers to as sleep hygiene. Which I, I used to think that was having a wash before you went to bed. But it, it's, it's not that. It's about having a regular bedtime. It's about never trying to, trying to go to sleep. You know, when you, when you, there are those times when you get into bed and actually you don't feel sleepy. You, you try and relax for a little while. But if, if actually you can't get to sleep, you don't stress about it. You don't keep trying to get to sleep. You get up, you do something else that's relaxing for a while, and then you go back and you try to sleep, okay? Obviously, you try and avoid things like caffeine or vigorous exercise before you go to bed. And the literature says that optimal sleepers have around about six to eight and a half hours sleep a night. And that people that can achieve that have a lower levels of depressive and anxiety symptoms, higher environmental mastery, in other words, they feel more in control of, of the, uh, the, the circumstances that, that surround them. They have better relationships with others, more purpose in life, and are more self-accepting. Appreciating is very important. <clears throat> and this brings me to uh, the subject of mindfulness. Mindfulness, mindfulness is about being attentive to and, and, and aware of the present moment. Okay, it's intentional, and it's accepting, and it's non-judgmental. And mindfulness is uh, being very, very heavily researched at the moment. It, uh, it's, it's an incredibly popular uh, topic for research in, in uh, medical schools and in schools of psychology and uh, schools of psychiatry. And they're finding that mindfulness has, has profound effects on um, um, not just mental well-being, but even people that have a quite severe mental health uh, disorders. <clears throat> and mindfulness practice has, actually, has now actually been shown to actually uh, uh, incur changes in the, in, in the brain. So this is one particular uh, publication that showed increases in um, regional brain grey matter density for people that had been part of a mindfulness-based stress reduction program for eight weeks. And there were particular regions of the brain that were involved in things like learning, emotional regulation, self-referential processing, so the way you think about yourself, and um, perspective taking. And the, the um, authors of the paper felt that it could be that through these um, uh, uh, physical changes in the brain that, um, uh, that they're actually forming the mechanism by which uh, mindfulness works. So it's an increased awareness of our internal sensations and improved integration of emotion and cognition through the mindfulness-based based stress re reduction may improve how we handle our stressful events. We need to keep learning new things. <clears throat> There's a gentleman called uh, Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi. And actually, that's not quite right. I always try and pronounce it, and it's, it's never quite right. Csikszentmihalyi, his name is. And um, 
he is based in the US, believe it or not, and uh, although he's from Eastern Europe, and he uh, has written several books and many publications about the subject of flow. So flow is something that I can guarantee we'll all recognize. Okay? Flow is that state of mind where we're so engaged, so involved in what we're doing, that everything else disappears from our consciousness. Okay? So there'll be, there'll be something, I'm, I'm certain, that every, everyone in this room will be able to identify with something that they do um, where they just, it's just like time disappears. They're not aware of anything else that around them. They're just so focused on what they're doing. They don't realize they're not worrying about anything else. They're not thinking about anything else. And they look up occasionally and all of a sudden two hours have gone past and they just had no appreciation of the time. Okay? So, and it's important that we try and enter that state of flow uh, as often we can and so uh, during during the week so if we can do that every day uh, for a portion of the day then that's that's great if we can't then we need to try and try and do it as often as we can okay and it's about whatever does it for you so for some people um, they might go into flow I don't know when they're riding a horse or um, for some people might go into flow when they're sitting working on an Excel spreadsheet you know it could be it could be what it could be whatever does it for you okay is is important okay but you'll 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 know what you'll know what does it for you so try and do it often direction is important we need to have goals to look forward to so goals are the way that we can turn our values and our dreams into reality. Okay, so we need to try and set and work towards goals that, that, uh, and those things then contribute to happiness. And they contribute to our happiness in various ways because obviously they're a source of interest, engagement or pleasure. They can bring a sense of meaning or purpose. When we achieve them, they bring a sense of accomplishment. And of course that in itself builds confidence and belief in what we can do in the future. We need to try and find ways to bounce back when we do go through setbacks. And of course we'll go through setbacks. That's, that's normal, that's, that, that's life. And one of the ways we can try and bounce back is to try and look for benefit in adversity. And the literature refers to post-traumatic growth. So, um, Sometimes, even when the, the worst possible things happen, the most terrible things, the most devastating things that can happen in our life, they're, they're, we will be able to find something that uh, actually, something positive that has come out of it. Even if it doesn't completely compensate for the, for the terribleness of the event that has happened. For example, it might be a bereavement. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting for one minute that um, the positive thing it actually um, uh, uh, compensates for the fact that you've, uh, there's been a recent loss of a life. Um, but it, but even, even in those terrible things, there can be some positive things. So for example, there's been a bereavement, but it's brought the family together. Um, you're now talking to your brothers and sisters more than you were before. Or, you know, so there can be some positive things. So always try and find those positive things in adversity. And try and ch challenge negative thoughts. And of course, there's a whole um, uh, therapy, if you like, whole talking therapy based around this called cognitive behavioral therapy. So we need to try and challenge our automatic negative thoughts, dispute pessimistic, pessimistic explanations, and reframe situations in a positive light. And, and an example I sometimes give of this is um, if I'm, I'm standing in front of an audience and someone might be looking at me, there they are, there's a lady now who's got my perfect eye, uh, perfect eye contact with me. <laughs> and, and, so got great eye contact with me. Now that could be for a number of reasons. <clears throat> could be because she was asleep and, and uh, but in a trance. But it could be because... <clears throat> It could be because my fly was undone, and she was thinking, oh my goodness, I wonder if he realized, the flunker at the front realizes that he actually, the flunker's almost hanging out. <laughs> or it could be that she finds me very attractive. It could be, it could be lots of different things, okay? So, but the, the reason I use that to illustrate it, though, is because we can, something can go wrong, or we can, we can think, or, 
or we can choose to interpret things however we want to interpret things. You know, I could interpret it very negatively. I could interpret it, you know, the fly's undone, I've got a spot on my nose, or she thinks I'm really boring, or, you know. And, and maybe I am all those things, and that, that might be right, but and maybe she does think all those things, but actually there's probably a load more reasons that, that, that actually, actually the, 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 that could account for her behavior, okay? that are nothing to do with those automatic negative thoughts that I'm having. Okay? So always try and dispute those automatic negative thoughts. <clears throat> There's good evidence in the literature to show that the more often we experience positive emotions, the easier they come next time round. Okay? So it's good to try and experience positive emotions as much as we can. We also need to try and reflect and savour upon and be grateful for the good things in our life. So all this sounds a little bit wishy-washy, doesn't it? But again, it's based on real evidence, real science. So let me give you an example, but there are, there are many others. Um, at the, so I was just trying to think of the lady's name, Professor Felicia Huppert at uh, University of Cambridge. So she's worked at, she's, uh, she works in the, um, uh, school of Psychiatry in the medical school and um, she has uh, done work uh, with people who uh, even have terminal cancer okay so they're hospitalized terminal cancer Adam Brooks Hospital and um, she's asked them to write down three things they're grateful for during the day okay so um, uh, at the end of the day, these people were asked to record the three things they were grateful for that had happened to them during that day or that they thought about during that day. Okay? And compared to a match group of, of um, uh, other patients who weren't doing, this, do, doing the same thing. <clears throat> okay? And beyond that study, uh, they were followed up for several, several uh, weeks and months afterwards. And the people that had kept the gratitude journal um, had far higher levels of mental well-being and they were sustained for a longer period of time than those people that hasn't. Okay, that's just one little tiny example, okay? But thinking about the positive things or the, or that have happened to you and the things that you're really grateful for each day is a good practice to get into, okay? And as I say, it's, it's evidence-based. So that, that, this is one, one thing that I, 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 I know I try and do every day. When I, when I get, get into bed at night, I must admit I don't write them down, but I do try and think about what are the thing, good things I'm grateful for today. And sometimes, uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's as simple as, uh, well, I've had a shit day, but I'm actual, actually grateful that, that it, it could have been a hell of a lot worse than it, that it, that it, that it really was, okay? So, but... It, Nevertheless, there have been some good things that have happened. We need to be, try and be comfortable with who we are, accept ourselves. So this is a good quotation. Care solely about other people's approval and you'll forever be their prisoner. So we need to try and identify our own personal strengths and live life in a way that allows us to use them to our fullest extent. And we need to give ourselves permission to be human. We shouldn't reject our emotions, be they positive or negative, because that can lead to frustration and, happiness, and unhappiness. And it's good to engage in activities that are meaningful to us. Okay, so being part of something that we uh, really believe in that's bigger than ourselves. Now, so some people, that's, that can be uh, a religious belief, okay? Um, but uh, t t to some people don't, don't have a religious belief, but you, could, you can still feel part of something that's much, much bigger. And if work isn't a calling, and we're fortunate um, being, being vets, so often work is a calling, but if work isn't a calling, then we need to... Uh, have a purpose that we can pursue elsewhere in our lives, okay? So we don't necessarily get that sense of purpose from our work. Well, we'll make sure we'll, we'll do it elsewhere in our lives. How much money do you need to be happy? It's 
It's a rhetorical question, don't worry, I wasn't <laughs> expecting anyone to, to answer. Again, a lot of literature now to show that material wealth beyond basic subsistence fails to produce enduring happiness. The literature refers to this as the diminishing marginal utility of income. In other words, the more we have, the we get used to it. And then we want more. And then we get used to that, and then we want more. Okay, so we become habituated, our aspirations rise, we continue to envy others um, who, who are better off, uh, and just it, so it goes on and on. <clears throat> there has been also been a lot of work with people who have won lotteries to find out what happens to their mental well-being when they win the lottery. And unsurprisingly, uh, in the short term, they feel a lot better about it themselves. You know, they've won the lottery, so their mental well-being... Uh, goes up. But actually their mental well-being, uh, just for the reasons we just talked about, uh, then goes back to its uh, previous level again very rapidly. Unless they do two different things. One is to give some of it away, okay, and um, the, apparently the thing that um, uh, brings the most sustain, sustainable increase in mental well-being when you're giving your lottery money away is when you give it to close friends and family. And the other thing that can, uh, that, that's good if you win the lottery is to spend it very sparingly on yourself, but when you do spend it on yourself to buy experiences rather than goods. So there we are, there's, there's my advice should you, should you win the lottery. But it's, it's easy to get caught up in, well, if, I, oh, if, only, I was, if only I earned more, it would make it this much easier, and if only I earned this bit more. Well, that, that's, that's true until you reach a certain level, but beyond that, um, money will not bring you enduring happiness, so, so don't expect it to. It might mean you can go and buy a bigger yacht or a bigger car, but that, it, won't, it won't bring you enduring happiness. <coughs> So thank you very much for your attention. I'm now going to hand back to Rosie, who's going to talk briefly about getting help if you're struggling. And then we'll be very happy to answer some, any questions that you have at the end. So, just going to spend, I know it's cute, isn't it? I can resist. <laughs> just going to spend a few minutes um, talking about supporting yourself, so getting support for yourself, but also about supporting other people. Um, again, this is one of Matthew Johnson's illustrations, but I like it um, because I think it illustrates a very, very important point. And I say this as someone who spends quite a lot of their time supporting other people or trying to, at least through Samaritans and through Vet Helpline. It's really, really, really important when you're supporting other people to know your own boundaries and your limitations and not to take too much on yourself. It's quite easy to do that. Um, certainly in a profession like ours, there's a lot of very caring people. Um, it is easy to take on too much. Sometimes it's better not to try to be a hero and to direct somebody to professional help if that's actually what they need. So don't take it all on yourself. Be aware of your own boundaries and limitations if you're supporting people. I want to talk about a little cycle about how to support other people. And I'm going to start with being proactive. So if you're worried about somebody, it's not always, and I would say this is especially the case with vets and vet students, it's not always the best thing to do to just wait for them to mention it. Some people just don't ever mention it. One of the things I find when I interview vet students, and I'm doing a big study, I'm doing more than 100 interviews with vet students in my current study, is that almost everybody at some point in the interview will say, I'm not the type of person who asks for help. That's one of the very, very, very common things. I could actually do you a graph of how many people have said that if anyone wants to see it, but there's a lot, it's a very, very commonly repeated phrase. I don't, know what the type, I don't know what the type of person is who doesn't ask for help, but it's not a very good strategy to have. But the case, the case if vet students aren't going to ask for help and you're worried about somebody, then often you need to be proactive in reaching out to them. So be proactive. Take time to consider what it is that they need. Consider what barriers there are to support. Now, this is another massive thing with vets and vet students. It's not enough necessarily to have services there and for wait and to wait for people to go to them. Vets often don't reach out for support. So consider what barriers there are. Listen, really, really important. It's amazing, evidence-wise, how much of a difference just listening can make. 
review what's going on, and then be proactive again. Talking about considering the barriers to support. We know that one of the reasons the veterinary suicide rate is high, and there's good evidence for this, and we know that one of the reasons that vets really struggle with their mental health is because of our reluctance as a profession to seek support. There's a lot of different reasons for that, which we can talk about in more detail if people want, but we know that for a fact. We know that there can be barriers to help, even when help seems available. We also know that people's personality may influence how likely they are to be able to seek help and also to engage with that help. Occupational culture. Now, it's a fairly big phrase. It's something I'm very interested in. Occupational culture exists at multiple levels. So there's a kind of beliefs and values that we have as a group of vets. There's the belief and values that you have as a group of students within a vet school. But then there's your own beliefs and values about your role as a professional as well. And one of the things that I find very commonly when I talk to vet students is this idea of not wanting to be seen as weak and also equating struggling or difficulty or finding things tough psychologically with being weak. Now, I think that's a completely incorrect set of beliefs in terms of the evidence that's there, but it is something that vet students do tend to believe. Fears about disciplinary process. This is another big one. And actually, it's a really unfortunate irony that often vets don't seek help with problems because they're worried that's going to get them into trouble with their disciplinary body, whereas actually not seeking help is far more likely to get you into problems with your disciplinary body and also stigma. I don't know if anyone can imagine what that picture's about. Any ideas? It's fairly straightforward. Can, there's, it's, there's five cats there, and one of them is, is the odd one out. Now, what I wanted to illustrate here was something called the imposter phenomenon. We've talked a little bit about perfectionism already. I think perfectionism is really important in terms of how vet students access help. But I think imposter phenomenon is also important. This has been identified in medics, dental, nursing, and pharmacy students. It's one thing I'm interested in looking at in vet students. What imposter phenomenon is, is when high-achieving individuals chronically question their abilities and fear that others will discover them to be intellectual frauds. So it's that, it's that feeling... I don't know if any of you have ever experienced it, but feeling that, oh my goodness, everyone else here is really smart. There's been some terrible mistake, and I don't belong. Now, I was once at a talk given by a friend of mine who's a fantastic speaker, and what he did was he, there were about 300 people in the room, all vets or vet students, and he got everyone to put their head on the desk and raise their hand if they've ever felt like an imposter. Can anyone, in, within a veterinary environment, can anyone guess what percentage approximately raised their hands? <laughs> it was everyone except one, I think. And that person was looking really like, oh, I think the person also felt that way. So yeah, it's, it's amazing. But we all hold this belief. And it's something I find with vet students who are having difficulty as well. And it's so sad. I did a study once where about 50% of the year group, and there was a pr pretty much 100% response rate, so it was really sort of solid research in terms of the numbers. About 50% of the year group were quite psycholo well, very psychologically distressed. Um, of, of the questionnaire that they did and then I went on to interview a group of students who'd had really severe difficulties with their mental health and what every single one of those students I interviewed said was that there's no way I can tell anybody because everyone else in my year is having a great time and they're all doing really well and they're all perfect and they've never had problems like me and I actually just wanted to say to them look 50% of your year are going through something at the moment please talk to somebody but there's all these kind of beliefs that we have that just don't quite fit with the reality. And anecdotally, it's something vet students commonly report. I also wanted to consider stigma. Stigma is really, really important in whether or not people seek help. In fact, it's the biggest thing that stops people seeking mental health support, and this isn't just among vets. Two different types of stigma, and I think one of these is actually more important than the other in vets, and we'll see if you agree with which one I think is more important. There's public stigma, which is the perception held by others that an individual is socially unacceptable. So if we're talking about stigma about mental health, it would be, well, me, for example, saying that I had depression and everyone in this room thinking, that's unacceptable, that's really bad, she shouldn't be a vet, all those kind of thoughts. Self-stigma would be if I had depression and I had the belief that that was unacceptable, so my own personal belief. I wonder which one you think is, is more relevant for vets. Self-stigma. It's strange, isn't it? Because we all know that, and yet it still carries on. 
What we know about VET stigma is that when you talk to VET students who've reported having suffering from stress, depression or anxiety, 75% have never sought help from anybody. In a study of UK vets with a history of suicidal thoughts or behaviours, this is a very interesting study with vets who had attempted suicide, half of participants never talked to anybody about their problems. And that was because they felt guilty or they felt ashamed. They were worried if they talked about it, they wouldn't be able to carry on as vets anymore. And that's absolutely not the case. Vet students also attitudinally differ, and I've got good statistics for this, from the general population in terms of their views about stigma, blame, and people not being supportive if they did talk. So here's just some snippets from the data. When presented with the statement, if I was suffering from a mental health problem, I wouldn't want people knowing about it. About 75% of vet students say I wouldn't want anybody to know. And this has been repeated at three different vet schools. It's quite good, quite robust data. Whereas only around about 44% of the general population say, yeah, I wouldn't want anyone else to know. When you present vet students with the statements, people are generally caring and sympathetic to people with mental health problems. Students are less likely to agree than the general population. The majority of people with mental health problems recover. Again, students are less likely to agree that mental health, people with mental health problems can recover. And this one's quite concerning as well. People with mental health problems should have the same rights as anyone else. Students are less likely to agree than the general population. It's a really, really concerning set of views. You can, I don't know if you can see how this picture is starting to emerge, that we're, we're a profession who may sort of self-select for difficulties. So we may have personality traits that put us at risk. We then go into these stressful situations, the aspects of our work, like a social aspects of our work that are difficult. But then if there's this stigma operating as well that's stopping us from seeking help, that's a really toxic and really unhelpful mix. But as we've said, there are things that we can do about it, and especially where a group of people like yourselves are together and you all know that this is an important issue, that stigma doesn't need to operate at the same level anymore. So in terms of support, I'm just going to very, very briefly highlight some places that people can go for support if you are struggling or if you know somebody who's struggling. Health services are a good place to go. Sometimes that can feel like a really big step, but sometimes going for professional support is the right thing to do in an emergency situation. It's also services within the university as well. The Irish Veterinary Benevolent Fund, I know that John McGee is here, if you want to wave, John, from the Irish VBF. Um, I was um, looking at their website when I was writing this talk, and I was amazed by how much they can offer vets and practice in Ireland in terms of support. It's a really, really fantastic service that they've got. Well worth having a look at their website, and when you get out into practice, if you need to, accessing their services. <coughs> As we said in the introduction, I'm involved with Samaritans as well, and I know Samaritans Ireland have a, have a complete 24-7 service. You can drop into the branch in Dublin. You can free phone them now. It doesn't cost you anything to call. You can text them. You can email them 24 hours a day. One thing I would say to you, having volunteered at Samaritans for nearly 10 years now, is that I have never, ever on a call thought, why did that person call me? Their problem isn't very important. I, with nearly every call, and, and certainly with pretty much every call on Vet Helpline, I think, I wish this person had called us earlier before it got this bad. Certainly it isn't the case on things like helplines like Samaritans that you have to be suicidal to phone or you have to be very distressed. If you're just going through something really difficult and you need someone to talk to about it who doesn't know you, who isn't going to tell anybody, that's what services like that are there for. And um, I would say that certainly every volunteer I've ever met has always wished that people would call earlier rather than later. It's so much easier to help somebody before things get really catastrophic. If you end up practicing in the UK, um, the VBF, which David and I um, represent here today, um, we've got a website and we've got a 24-7 um, phone line. Um, we support people by email as well. You're very welcome to use our email service. It's all on the website. Have a look. <coughs> So I'm just going to go through this cycle again because I think it's important and it's very straightforward as well. Some people feel very overwhelmed when they see someone in distress and they don't know what to do. They think it should only be professionals who intervene. One thing that all of the evidence around suicide prevention and around helping people who are going through difficulty suggests is that actually if you just listen to somebody and care about them, you're not going to do anything wrong and you could very well really help that person. So be proactive. Take time to consider what it is that they need. Consider what it might be that's stopping them from seeking support. We're all very intellectually sophisticated individuals. We know that there is support there. If somebody isn't seeking help, there's probably something stopping them. 
Listen to the person. I just can't overemphasize how important that is. Review things with them and then carry on being proactive in your support for them. So just to emphasize a final point, um, which is from David's talk, is the importance of developing and maintaining those confiding relationships. And if you don't have anybody to confide in and you're experiencing difficulty, there are people there who want to listen, people like the Samaritans, people like the helpline, all of those kind of things. And finally, <laughs> a message from David and myself that there's light at the end of the tunnel and there's always somebody there who wants to help. You're never on your own. So thank you. Um, truly inspirational uh, presentations by both David and Rosie, uh, for sure. And uh, I sense lots of chords being struck right around this room. There wasn't one of us who didn't feel that. So um, this, these, these wonderful presentations are now open for, for uh, questions and comments. And remember that afterwards we're heading over to the Vet Cafe where we have refreshments so we can continue the conversation. So please now um, op open for questions and, and, and any comments. Does anyone have any? Yeah. Please. When we talk about uh, the range of risk factors of depression and suicide in veterinary students and veterinarians, are we talking exactly about the same thing? Because often it was said that, well, of course, vets commit suicide. They have ketamine and other drugs, but you can hardly use that argument with students. Sure. I mean, certainly that's a very good point. In terms of, of the way that veterinary risk is measured, access to means is one of the risk factors, but it isn't the only risk factor. And so because it isn't the only risk factor, although that risk may vary with a vet or a vet student, the other risks are quite similar. So it used to be the case that if you went to a suicidology conference, these conferences that you know, look at the research on suicide, if you went there 10 years ago and you presented the data on vets, that vets are three to four times more likely than the general population to die by suicide, people would say that's just because of access to means. In fact, I was at a conference in 2005 where somebody said to me, if lawyers had access to the drugs that vets do, lawyers would have the same suicide rate. And we actually know now that's not the case. So it's a small part of it, yes. But the other risk factors, there is a lot of similarity. So I don't know if that answers your question, but... Oh. Um, I'm just really struck by what you said, the, the role that stigma plays in people not accessing help, but in Chico Victoria, you know, that's what we're told. And I just wondered, you know, in, in your research, are there, are there identifiable tasks about how people can challenge the role of beliefs or how, they, how these stigma can be overcome? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Something that two vet schools in the UK are trying at the moment is peer support schemes, which are really quite, um, it's quite a big thing. For Basically, these are support schemes where students are trained as supporters to support other students. And although students might find it quite difficult to go and talk to another student, they might actually find it easier. But just the fact that that exists, I think, in itself challenges stigma because it says, look, this is a really important thing to be doing. In terms of the evidence based on challenging stigma on mental health more generally, it's something that um, governments and a lot of sort of big charities like Mind and the Mental Health Foundation do a lot of work on. There's different things that you can try, lots of anti-stigma campaigns and this kind of thing. But I think it's one of those things that often you need a multifaceted approach. There isn't just one easy fix. I wish there was. Um, it's a case of everybody needing to be involved. Hi, um, I often think that uh, as from a student's perspective that a lot of discussion around the topic kind of comes as a reaction to something that's happened. Um, like I know myself and Andrew are involved in the student side and we always try to think of ways to kind of install activities as like a prevention method. Like, yeah. With the schools that you work with, like, what are you doing with the students like, from like, a student's perspective? Yeah, sure. So um, I've been really lucky and I've been invited to a few different schools, um, well, four 
five different best schools in, in the UK um, to be involved in their welfare weeks and student weeks. And what I really, really love, because I, I have formalised teaching that I do on wellbeing and stress in at Edinburgh, but what I love is student welfare week where the students organise it, because I think it's so much more authentic if, if you guys are organising it. Um, for example, last year, Edinburgh students, um, they, they had a range of activities. They had a whole welfare week. They had a puppy morning where there was just a room full of puppies. That everyone, it, was, it was totally awesome. <laughs> but... <laughs> there is a really, you know, there's some, there's, you know, there's vet schools in the States that use therapy dogs that go in and cheer up the students. One of the things that I've found in my research that actually impacts vet student well-being is, although we don't admit it at interview, a lot of us come to vet school because we love animals and then we're at university and we can't have our pets with us. And that can be a big impact. So things like having access to animals, that kind of thing. But yeah, student, student welfare weeks have had a whole range of different activities and I think they're absolutely brilliant. And I can certainly send you the, the sort of timetables for them if you're interested for different ones. Um, I think one of the best ways to combat stigma is if the actual people who are involved in a group or an organisation just start talking about it and doing stuff, um, because that will challenge it. That is the best way to deal with it. I don't know if David's got anything to. No, I was going to say I, I talked about mindfulness in my talk. One of the one of the vet schools uh, actually runs a it, it's a um, Saskatchewan in the west coast of uh, Canada. They they run an elective called Mindful Veterinary Practice, and uh, it's the most elective elective on their on their course. And um, uh, the it's the professor of um, a veterinary pharmacology actually teaches uh, this this mindfulness uh, elective, and uh, and she's she's also um, uh, uh, she, she I think don't think it's actually in a peer reviewed journal yet, but certainly she's she's uh, um, uh, looked at how the how levels of mental well being change during the mindfulness course, and then. Uh, and followed people up over several months afterwards. So she's even got some evidence to show that doing a, a mindfulness vet, vi mindful veterinary practice elective um, uh, help, helps people. So, uh, yeah, there are lots of different things happening at different universities. Mm. That's a good idea. Mm. In, uh, in veterinary practice, I, I assume there are different stresses, which there are, between group practice and individual one-man practice. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in the in the suicidology of vets in group practice as opposed to group um, vets single man practice? Yeah, so when I talked about the subgroups of vets that were at risk, the three subgroups of vets that are most at risk of suicide are female vets, vets under 35 years old, and people working on their own. So yeah, lone practice can be really difficult. I think also emphasising the point that it isn't necessarily just physical isolation, psychological isolation within a group practice. If, for example, you're out at a branch practice on your own and you don't have people who you can relate to in that practice, you can become very psychologically isolated even when there are people around. But, yeah, lone working is a big risk factor. There's also risk factors around suicide more generally, which is associated with rurality. So either living in a very high-density city or living in a rural area are both risk factors for suicide. I mean, it's really difficult, isn't it, when there's so much stigma about things like seeing a doctor about your mental health to mention that to somebody. I think genuinely, though, and although people don't always receive the news well, um, I think just saying to somebody, I'm concerned about you, can I come with you to the doctor? Can I, you know, can I sit in the waiting room with you? Do you think it would help to talk to somebody about this? You know, do you have any other support? I'm really worried about you. Just being honest with them. I think with, um, it's a strange thing at Samaritans, but we often, um, we sometimes do these calls where somebody will ring us and they will say can you ring my friend I'm really worried about them and actually although the person is a bit surprised that someone's done that usually once they've sort of got over their shock they're just genuinely touched that somebody cares mm. so although they might kind of kick back at first actually they'll get the message that you care and I think just being authentic and being a friend and listening makes a really big difference yeah uh, I was just, just, just as you were talking about that. I was just thinking about the importance of um, uh, if you can encourage someone in what, in whatever way. And listening is one way to do it. Or, or, but um, 
if you can encourage someone to, to think very carefully about, about their circumstances and are either articulate it, so speak it or write it down, um, uh, that forces people to think about things in such a way that gives them a greater sense of control over what's happening to them. And they end up feeling a lot, lot better. And this whole, um, you've heard of the, the saying, you know, a problem shared is a problem halved. It's, it, that, it, that is real, you know, that really is absolutely true. So even if you're able just to listen to them and, and, and uh, get them to, to share their problems with you for a short while, um, I appreciate, you know, you, you don't want them burdening you every, every day, but um, anything you can, you can do to, to help them to uh, articulate those, those, those difficulties will help them. It's actually one of the false beliefs that vets actually have about mental health, that especially vets who are having difficulties, is they have what we call an external locus of control. So they believe, they become very, very passive, and they think that they have absolutely no ability to influence things. So sometimes just helping someone to take those steps, take a bit of control, makes them feel a bit better. And just developing on that a bit, a bit more, actually, is, is that... Um, uh, a lot of uh, people that I've spoken to that have had vets that have had mental health related problems, and you and one of the, you ask them about their help seeking and why they why they didn't seek help or, or why they did seek help, and one of the things that comes across quite frequently is well, I, I, there was no point in me asking for help because who was going to be able to change that? You know, it was it, there was this people people think they don't recognize or vets don't seem to recognize the value of emotional support you know you, um, even if someone else can't change the circumstances for you um, that doesn't that doesn't negate the value of going to someone else to get support so recognize that um, uh, you may have, you may well have difficulties, uh, which where the circumstances can't be changed. You know, there, there, could, there are plenty of circumstances we find ourselves in where those circumstances cannot be changed. But you still need to seek support. You still need to go and talk to someone about them, not because they can change the circumstances, but because you need emotional support, and that will be able, that will help you to cope that much better. certainly in the earlier part of my veterinary school career as a, an early stage student probably didn't have that feeling very intensely but I think probably in the clinical phase I did and certainly when I started to do a, a PhD I have and I do ever since because thank god if my stuff isn't as good as everyone else then it's really terrible so if, if, if this feeling is really common among veterinary students there must be a strategy that we can use to ensure that the feedback given to students is such as to reduce those levels of yes, interesting not, point Inherent in, in one person, it depends on the person. I'm only yeah. aware of, you maybe know yeah. more of all this, but there's one paper, isn't there, in the, in the, in, in the Journal of Veterinary Medical Education, I think, there's that talks one. about. Is there another yeah, one? Yeah, so um, there's actually just been some quite a big research project done in Edinburgh looking at feedback and mental health, and Rachel Whittings is going to publish it quite soon. But yeah, absolutely, I think there are ways that we can do feedback. One of the things that always comes up in interviews I do with students around about transition is their clinical feedback. And one of the things that kind of terrifies me is the way that students compare clinical feedback. So <laughs> the stuff people put on, so people post their clinical feedback on Facebook, they post the number of bitch faces they've done on Facebook, all this stuff. And it's, it's, it's so difficult in a competitive environment like that to deliver meaningful feedback. And I don't underestimate how difficult it is for clinicians either wanting to give something meaningful that's going to help students develop but not make things worse. Than, but I think there are strategies, yeah, absolutely. So um, look out for Rachel Whittington's paper that's coming out. Please. Right. Um, I know that you made a uh, risk factors you said it was specific to a veterinary profession. Do you recommend like seeking out for a kind of veterinary health clients rather than kind of straight follow up on feedback with those kind of like community? Sure. Uh, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, as someone who does Samaritans and Vet Helpline, people at Samaritans sometimes ask me, Well, what does Vet Helpline do that's different? And I think what, what the vet services do that's different is when it's something that it just feels too much to explain to somebody else, somebody from outside, 
what it is to have a bitch spay bleed out on you or what it is to have something go wrong on vet. So I think that's the extra thing that vet services can offer, that they just understand a bit what it's like to be in this environment or to have something go wrong at work or to feel very judged by your clients. But I would say if you're in difficulty, sometimes you might want to go outside the vet profession. If, for example, you're feeling a bit claustrophobic in the vet profession or you're worried somebody will know you, go completely anonymous and go outside. So I'd say use both, use whatever. One thing I often say to people when they're seeking support is that it can sometimes take a few tries to find the right place or the right person. A lot of it's quite personal. It's just whether you click with the person and you can't always predict that. So if you try once and it doesn't feel right, try somewhere else. Do it straight away. Put the phone down, just try somewhere else. So, um, as I said, we hope to continue the conversations over in the vet cafe. The other thing is, I think in the vet school, we're really keen on trying to build on this, like something collaborative and, and to try and, you know, get something happening locally, you know, with, with you know, having conversations with yourself afterwards, because this has just really been, a, I think, a wonderful uh, opportunity to, to listen to both of you delivering like, the evidence-based um, data around this whole really important area. So, can we just um, uh, thank both Rosie and uh, Rosie.